Hi, good afternoon. Um, yes, I, I do space weather. Um, I'm actually part of NOAA out in Boulder, and let me give a shout out to my team, um, or the, the team we have out in Boulder, which is a combination of NESDIS folks, so we're on the acquisition side, as well as the National uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, which is on the operational side. So we have a really nice uh, um, relationship with both the um, uh, the acquisition side as well as the operators uh, on in space weather. Um, what can I say? Oh, <laughs> sure. What I want to do next is uh, Greg had some really <coughs> slick videos, and um, I'm sorry I don't have as slick videos as, as he does. Uh, nor do I have the voice track. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to show a video in the in the background, and I'm going to be speaking in the foreground. And I tried to orchestrate this. Uh, and I, I, it came a little bit stilted, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go freeform, and hopefully that uh, it makes a little bit more sense. So anyway, um, my next slide, and I have to start this because as soon as I, um, as soon as I press it, it'll start out, is uh, talking about space weather. And uh, space weather, um, the, start, the early start of this, there's a relationship that we knew that space weather had a, um, that, that, that solar uh, observations or solar phenomena was affecting the Earth. Now, more recently, when we moved from solar flares, we realized that uh, with the satellites that there was gaseous explosions from the sun, which actually were affecting the Earth, these so-called coronal mass ejections, these large volumes of gas that are pushed out from the sun and head towards Earth. Now, this is against the background of a, of a background flow of gas that is coming from the sun. Now, if you, would, if you could step back and look at the Earth, you would see that the magnetic field of the Earth actually deflects a lot of these particles. These are radiation level particles, and so very high energy. Not only uh, so you have the particle energy as well as the, uh, the photonic energy, the x-rays, both of which uh, are, could be hazardous if, they, if man were exposed to that directly. So the magnetic field and the atmosphere of the Earth really protect us from the harmful uh, rays from the sun. Um, as you, as you sort of focus in on this topology of this magnetic field, you can see what's happening is on the front side, you're getting pressure from the solar wind is pushing the, the magnetic fields inward and then dragging them out on the, on the back end. Now, this, this produces a very dynamic uh, particle environment. And if you were to take a look at the, the gases or the particles that are flowing down into the atmosphere, you get things like the aurora. So these energetic particles are creating the aurora. And, and really, that was the first manifestation of, of space weather from the, from the early, to early days. Now, when these particles come into the atmosphere, they also generate currents, which have, a, which have an impact on power grids, um, long uh, pipelines. Um, the, uh, one of the um, classic uh, uh, cases that happened within the space age is the 1989 geomagnetic storm. So it's a geomagnetic storm that disrupted many parts of the eastern part of Canada. Now that, of course, um, is, is the space age. If you were to go back and try to take a look at the granddaddy of uh, things that may have happened, you'd get back to the 1859 Carrington event. Now, we talked about that, but also the ionosphere is affected by, this, by, the, by um, space weather. The, actually, the ionosphere is established by the sun because of the particles that, you know, the photons that are produced or that, uh, that are ejected towards Earth. Um, but in addition, space weather is perturbations on that background, of, uh, background flow, which can cause disruptions in terms of communications either from the ground, um, bouncing like uh, ham operators, as well as communications through, uh, through this, this atmospheric layer. Now, um, I think we're just about getting to the end of this, but so I've got to find out what the next thing is. Um, so, um, okay, so another aspect of this is the GPS, which is dependent upon the radio, radio waves passing through the ionosphere. And the ionosphere is one of the major, is the major um, noise or uh, noise source for GPS on dual frequency receivers. So it has an impact on, on, uh, on uh, agriculture as well as the various other industries like the fishing industry. Getting back to my, my forte is actually taking a look at the satellite environments and taking a look at uh, how the space environment, how space weather affects satellites. Again, what we have is very energetic particles in the near Earth space environment. Uh, cosmic rays can inject themselves into electronics. Um, lower energy particles can cause um, um, surface charging. And, and the, the, the neat thing about it is that in order to do forensics, it's, we, don't, we can't get to the patient anymore. The patient's gone. 
And so what we have to do is we have to anticipate what, try to understand what, how the space environment has affected the, um, has affected the satellite system. Uh, very quickly went through and talked about manned space flight. Uh, that's another a big aspect of space weather. And as we get into the GOES-R era and the SUVI instrument, the Solar Ultraviolet Imager, it bases its capabilities on a lot of sensors that have gone, flown um, before it. So we're getting ourselves into the era where we have the, currently we have the Solar Dynamics Observatory, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, which is the heritage instrument for GOES-R. Okay, so that was my, my primer. Um, Greg brought you back to 1975. I'm going to bring you back even earlier. And what I'm going to do is, again, radio communications. Assured radio communications was a very early um, concern for, at the time, it, they, they didn't refer to it as space weather, but it was, they knew that there were things that were happening on the sun that were affecting the Earth. During the Second World War and following, the, um, they, they tried to make the relationship between um, solar flares, solar observations, and things that, and the things that were affecting the ground-based communication. Um, here's actually an image that I found in our archives as I was going through some old files. And this is a photograph of some ladies who were doing um, sunspots. And what they're doing is they're counting up sunspots because at the time, I and mean, this is the, this is the, the mid-50s or so and, and, and before when they did this, that was really the only way they could assess what was going on, um, provide um, that what, they, what they thought would be assured communications. Um, interestingly enough, when I, I tried to figure out who these ladies were, okay, and I found one of these ladies. She's actually still alive. She lives in, in Kansas someplace, and she was able to uh, give me a little bit of the background on this. So it, was, it was really interesting to find this photograph. Um, it came out of the National Bureau of Standards. Um, I didn't know much about it, but, but I knew what they were doing, okay? And then be able to make that tie back to a real person who said, who could tell me a little bit more about what was going on, and when basically identified herself and the other, per, other lady in the picture. Um, in the late 50s, okay, so we talked about radio communications, and what you'll see is that that actually is, is, a, is a thread that will carry through the entire GOES program to the current one. Okay, the other aspect is taking a look at energetic particles and, and the, 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 if the issues that would happen with manned space flight. At the time, back in, the, back in this case, the late 50s, so just after the dawn of the, at the dawn of the space age, they, they flew a series of rockets, um, and they found out that space is radioactive, okay? And so um, the gentleman in the middle, if you know, is, would, if you know him, is, is, is Van Allen, famous for the Van Allen radiation belts. He discovered the, the fact that space was re, uh, radioactive, and that's great, okay, very good. But then people realized, well, if we're going to send astronauts up into space, um, what, are, what are we putting, you know, what are we doing? What are we, what are we sending them into? And so this became the other thread that has actually carried through the entire GOES program is to be able to look at times when there's enhanced radiation in space. Um, and indeed, today, they still monitor that, uh, um, that for manned space flight. Now, a lot of the stuff we do is uh, I'll, I'll put a, give a shout out to the Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Boulder Colorado, which is the current... Uh, organization that sends out the alerts and warnings on, on space weather. Now I got a couple of their, couple of their graphics here that uh, I, I was able to pull down and uh, what I want to do here is show you on the left, okay? So what you're looking at here is take a, just focus on the upper um, spiraling spiral that's happening here. You're looking at gases that are flowing from the sun, which is in the center of this, flowing towards Earth, which is that little green dot to the right, a couple of satellites are over on the left-hand side of that circle, but this, uh, this spiraling out of, this, of these gases, okay, what they're trying to do is they're trying to predict when those, uh, when those gases would, would hit Earth. Uh, the sliding, the slide on the, to, to the right of that left-hand left panel shows actually observations from uh, a satellite that's sitting at the L1 point. Uh, it's about 240 Earth radii in forward direction looking at monitoring that, uh, monitoring the density of the gases. So you're trying to uh, do that correlation so you can get an advance warning, several days warning as to what, what the gases that are flowing in interplanetary space and how they are heading towards Earth. In addition, you have this more uh, 
you have, uh, you have measurements in close proximity to the Earth. And this is at, again, at the L1 point, gives you about 45 minutes heads up as to not only do we think something's heading your way, it is heading your way. It's going to hit you, okay? Now, on the right-hand panel of that is uh, taking a look at something which is, uh, I would say, for a rural, um, well, if for a rural enthusiast. And let me see if I can start this. Okay, there we go. And so in, in this case here, what you're now doing is you're looking down on, at high latitudes at the auroral zone. And of course, the interesting thing here is you'd like to be able to um, predict or monitor the occurrence of aurora. And again, this is using a predictive-based capability based on measurements taken in deep space to be able to anticipate what the aurora is going to be doing um, in, in the next couple of hours. Now, as I look at this, this is great. You're looking at it from, this, from space down to Earth. I think what would be really neat is to be able to um, tie this into cloud cover because if you have nice aurora but you have cloud cover, people on the ground aren't going to be able to see it. So be able to tie a product like that to um, be able to predict the occurrence of aurora on a clear night would, e would be even more beneficial. All right, um, I think uh, Greg talked about the various uh, um, satellite systems that uh, that, that have, um, that have uh, been part of the NOAA portfolio. And I kind of break them up into some very simplistic type of things from, from a space weather uh, perspective. Uh, we both monitor as well as forecast. Okay, so we have on the extreme left of this, we have the polar orbiting satellite systems. They monitor the local space environment. They're, they're measuring what's going on now. They don't, they don't have any predictive capability, okay? Uh, if you go to the extreme right of this, now you're taking a look at uh, the Discover spacecraft, which was launched uh, about a year and a half, right out, right out here. Um, and it's now sitting, it's parked at the L1 location, 240 Earth radii forward of the Earth in the sunward direction. It's monitoring things that are coming into you. In that case, it's a forecast capability. It doesn't, doesn't monitor, it, it gives you the forecast capability. Okay, so now, now we're getting to GOES in the middle of this, and now GOES has both a monitoring function as well as a forecast function because you're measuring the in situ, you're measuring the environment at geosynchronous by the, by the particle detectors and various and field detectors that you have there. But in addition, you're looking at the sun. So, you're, you're, so you're, you have that forecast capability of things that are heading, that, heading toward you. At the same time, you're measuring things that are occurring in, 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 in the geospace, in the uh, geosynchronous orbit. And of course, that's where most of our communication satellites, so that's an extremely important uh, location. All right, um, I like to think of uh, um, GOES as sort of being the energizer bunny of space weather. It's been around for a long time, and it's made a lot of measurements somewhat similar to what's being done now in improvements. This is a composite chart showing over, in this case, 30 years of space weather data, okay? Um, GOES is actually in the middle set of panels on this. We're taking, in the upper set is uh, the, the traditional um, um, sunspot cycle showing the 11 year cycle of the sun. But what it's showing in the middle pattern is the, uh, the probability or the, or the um, frequency with which you could expect extreme flares, X class flares. You, the, the probability with which you could expect Solar, pro solar particle events, these extremely energetic particles at interplanetary space that, that pose a hazard to uh, um, satellites as well as uh, manned space flight. Okay, with that in mind, um, the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center has, uh, in, in a sort of a tip of the hat to our tropospheric colleagues, has come up with a set of scales which give people sort of a, 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 a gross sense of, as to what may be happening. In this case here, we're taking a look at radio blackouts. Okay, so this is that communication side of things. And if you notice, um, in, the, um, in the second from the right column, it's, what it's doing is it's measuring, X, it's giving you a rating in terms of the X-ray strength of the, or the intensity of the, the X-ray flux coming in. So this is a direct measurement from, from GOES and for, and for GOES-R. So this is a, a scale that is directly driven by the GOES data. Now, I, I, I don't want to over, one of the things we have in, in space weather is to, um, to uh, overstress the importance of space weather. 
So I'm just going to give you an, sort of an anecdotal thing. But I understand that uh, there's, you know, when, it, when a tornado is coming my way, I probably am not looking at sunspots. Okay? Um, but anecdotally, let me, let, me, so let me tell you something. This is a, and this is a very personal thing because uh, um, this is a, um, a documented uh, uh, situation that happened in the early part of the Afghanistan war. And, and, and several troops were killed, unfortunately, but this. Um, but what had happened is the, the helicopter, which was heading into a hostile area, didn't know it was heading into a hostile area, but headquarters did. Okay? And so what the headquarters was desperately trying to do was to communicate with the, with, with the helicopter pilots, telling them, you're going into a, hot, uh, into a hot zone. Be careful. Know what you're getting into. They never got the message. And, and the reason why this is kind of personal is that um, I had the opportunity to sit and, and talk with one of the troops that, were, that actually were sitting on the plane. Okay? And they were saying, we couldn't understand what was going on. We were getting all garbled messages. But they flew into a hot situation unbeknownst to them. Okay? The space weather was probably a contributing cause to that. Because as, as I was mentioning earlier, if you don't have assured communications, you've got problems. And that's what happened in this case. Now, um, let's talk about this forecast versus monitoring function. Because again, now this is all, this is all GOES data. And this is uh, taken over a six-day period. Okay, so this, is, this takes us back to that 1989 storm, which I mentioned in passing earlier, early on. And uh, that's another personal experience, which I'll share in just a moment. But in this case here, what you're seeing in the, in the top in the, in the top panel is you're seeing the actual x-ray measurement. So it's a, measure, a measurement of the x-ray irradiance of the sun, me, the detection of a solar flare. And notice that that solar flare occurred and that on, early on this, in this panel. Several days later, the effect, there were other effects that, were, that hit the Earth. So where you might expect to see a solar flare, you'd get prompt effects at the speed of light affecting the ionosphere. If you have a coronal mass ejection, those are particles that are being kicked out in space, not at the speed of light. They'll take several days to propagate towards you. And that's what's actually buffeting the front of the magnetosphere, causing this so-called geomagnetic storm. And you're, so what you're seeing here, you're seeing the, the flare, which occurred on day one. Two days later, uh, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, three days, two and a half days later, you're measuring in a spike or an increase in the energetic particles that are in interplanetary space. And then finally, what you're seeing a little bit later is you're seeing the local magnetic field measured by, um, by GOES basically go bonkers. Okay? And you, so you're measuring this propagation of things that this forecast of something that's happening heading towards the Earth to the monitoring function that, um, that is occurring. Now, the reason I say this is sort of another personal experience is that uh, at the time, and this is not, this, these are not GOES measurements, but these are measurements taken by, by a satellite at the time, taking a look at the equatorial extent of, or the latitudinal extent of the aurora. And at this particular time, at March 89, the, uh, the auroral zone had expanded large enough uh, so that aurora was observed in the mid-Atlantic you know, mid states. And, and I remember, this is very early on my, in my career, I was, sit, you know, I was in Boston at the time. I mean, that's where I was working. Um, and I looked overhead, and it was my first experience having seen an aurora. I mean, and it, there, and it's, it's actually almost, almost a spiritual, sit, uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, experience. But we, I saw the aurora overhead. And so I, I actually wrote a couple of papers on this. But that was a, that was a real tie back into this extreme event that occurred in the modern space age. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do a transition. Now, I've given us sort of a lot, a lot of background. So let's transition to Gozar. And, and Greg showed some of, these, uh, some of these slides, so um, some of them I may not need to spend too much time on. Um, the four sensors that are involved in space weather. Um, the particle, you know, the in-situ particle detectors, which is the SICE instrument. The in-situ magnetic field, uh, which is another um, um, measuring the local magnetic fields around the spacecraft. And then you have these forecast capabilities uh, to, the, to the left here, which is the solar ultraviolet imager and the X-ray irradiance sensor. So let me, let, me go th let me step through them, and I'll try to give a, a little bit of example for, for each. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, Space Weather Prediction Center had, had, a, had a set of scales. There's three scales they have. They have. Um, two of them are directly driven by GOES-type measurements. 
the um, space environmental sensor suite actually is monitoring the, um, the particles in, near, in the near Earth space environment. It's driving this so-called space radiation storm. If you had gone back and take a look at the, uh, the earlier um, uh, the scale I gave you, that was primarily focused on communications, communications and navigation. This, you can see, uh, on the space solar radiation storm brings a biological aspect into it. So, they, so the, not only are the scales tailored to the phenomena, they're tailored to the impacts in terms of who they, who they really affect. Um, um, as, I, as I indicated earlier, um, spacecraft charging is sort of my, my, my forte, where, where I've spent a, a lot of time. Um, this was an anomaly that occurred uh, back in the early 2010, I think it was, yeah, 2010 time frame. And, um, and it was a communication satellite that uh, basically lost connection to the ground. It was actually called, if you, if you trace yourself back, you'll see it was uh, also called a zombie sat because it was no longer communicating with ground, but it didn't know it was dead. Okay, so it kept, uh, it kept working and doing things that were disruptive to other satellites in the, in the, in the uh, near-Earth uh, vicinity. Um, because of the um, number of the GOES satellites we had in orbit at the time, in, in, in this satellite was sort of embedded between, you know, amongst all these GOES satellites, we were able to very clearly classify and understand what was going on. Now, I, I don't want to do a play on words, but this to me was the perfect storm of spacecraft charging because it happened at a time of year when you expect to see a, an enhanced coupling between the sun and the earth. Um, the, um, the, the satellite was in, uh, was in shadow, it came out of shadow, it affects the its charge distribution on the satellite. And the third aspect was this is in the middle of a geomagnetic storm. So by looking at the in space environment, we were able to ascertain that this was probably a, 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 um, a case of deep dielectric charging within the spacecraft that occurred. Um, you know, the good news is that uh, about uh, nine months after this uh, event happened, uh, the, like I said, the satellite didn't know it was dead. I mean, it really wasn't dead. It just kept uh, working in its autonomous, uh, on its autonomous mode. But about, about nine months later, it started losing the lock on the sun, okay? At which point, its batteries were, were when, when started draining down. Okay, when the, when the batteries drained to a point that the satellite got to what I consider to be its reptilian brain, it issued a reset. And as soon as it issued that reset, everything came back up, okay? So there was a, it was a soft, upset that took a satellite down for about nine months. All right, let's go to uh, another sensor, the, the, um, the irradiance sensor. And, and what you're seeing at the, on the right-hand side of this is the current SXI, solar x-ray imager. Um, along the bottom trace of that is the um, measurements from the, um, uh, from the irradiance sensor. So you're measuring both the sun in terms of its x-ray image as well as its irradiance. So, We'll be, what we'll, we'll be doing is we'll be replacing the X-ray imager with the ultraviolet uh, imager, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, the magnetometer. As I said earlier, the, the pressure on the front of the magnetosphere pushes that ma the Earth's magne that magnetic field inward on the sunward side and drags it out into, into the back end. So in this case here, what you're doing is you're monitoring that location of that magnetopause. You're mon modeling where that magnetopause is based on various other phenomena, but then you also, when the, when, the, when the magnetosphere gets pushed inside of geosynchronous orbit, now you're able to detect interplanetary space with the satellite. So at that point, GOES becomes an interplanetary satellite, okay? Um, the reason that's important is that uh, um, GOES was never intended to be an interplanetary satellite, but, it, but here it is. So it's in a different environment, and, and I really, you know, and I, the, the satellite community has done a great job in making satellites that are robust and basically resilient to space weather, okay? But every now and then, something happens they didn't account for. Um, and again, you do all your modeling, your development, assuming that you're in a geostationary environment well inside the, well inside the, the cocoon of the magnetic field of the Earth, and suddenly, in, a, in situations, you're actually thrown out into interplanetary space, not because you move, but because that, that, that front end of the magnetosphere got pushed in far enough. 
All right, um, solar ultraviolet imagery. This is the, uh, the new, this is what I would consider the, everything else to what you've seen in terms of instruments is what I would consider the an evo evolu evolutionary increase. To me, the uh, solar ultraviolet imagery is going to be revolutionary in terms of its ability to be able to do solar forecasting. Uh, look at the detail with which you're able to look at the Earth. Now, this is, uh, this is not SUBI, obviously, because it hasn't been launched. But what this is, is this is that, that heritage instrument that, that is sitting on the Solar Dynamics Observatory that is from the NASA side of things, which will now be pulled into the, into the operational side. So we, uh, and in the, on the left-hand side of this, you can see that the, the various wavelengths over which you're monitoring the sun. And you, actually, you take those wavelengths and you're able to produce this comp composite. So, um, I don't believe that, uh, I think it may have been mentioned this morning in another meeting, but uh, what will happen with this, uh, yes, Steve Goodman mentioned this this morning, is that by d taking a look at these various wavelengths, you can automatically um, identify features on the sun and, 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 and locate things that are going to be what we would consider to be um, geo-effective, things that could affect the Earth. I think I've got just, uh, um, I think this may be, Oh, I, I, got, I got two more slides. I got a couple more slides. Okay. Um, you've seen this a number of times. This is just another image uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of one of the wavelengths. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you that in the next one, because, and let me, let me sort of gear you up as to what's going on. In the next one, what you're going to do is you're going to see, um, you're going to see the sun in the center, and you're going to see the sun kick off a, um, a gas. So it's going to kick off what we refer to as a coronal mass ejection. And it, so what will ha then happen is it will draw you back. So you're now you'll be going further and further back as this, uh, as this gaseous cloud moves in, a, in an east, you know, off, off, to the, off to the right. And so it will bring you further and further back at to, to such a point that you'll stop. And then what it will do is it will start to zone in and take a look at uh, what, where the Earth is. Now, now the impression I want to get, I want you to walk away with is that um, the sun doesn't care about us. Okay? We, you know, you know, we're not, nothing we do can make, some, make, make a hill of beans to the, to the sun. And we are a small player in, in, our, in our solar system. And when, when we try to do solar measurements, um, we have only a few assets in which we have to cover a large area of space. So let's go to this. And let me show you what's, again. So what you're going to look for here is you see a gas a cloud kicked off from the Earth. You're backing away from the sun, so you're seeing the solar, you know, the solar radii get larger and larger and larger mm -hmm. as we get further and further away. So this cloud is getting bigger, you know, it's just expanding as it's moving off to the right. Um, I think this will stop in about uh, just a, a minute or so. Okay, so now it's stopped. Now what you're going to do is you're going to focus in on where the Earth is in this in this system. Okay, now this is now this is to scale. That's the thing I want you to, to walk away with. That this is to scale, and eventually. You see the Earth in this, so you, you're basically coming out of the noise, and there's the Earth. And so that's why I say that the Sun doesn't care about us, okay? But we care about the Sun. Okay. Um, last remarks. Uh, again, the thing I would like you to walk away with is that uh, the GOES data um, and GOES R will continue this. Will drive two of the three space weather scales. The third scale being a geomagnetic storm index, which is driven by ground-based ma magnetometers. Um, and that the Gozar is a critical asset for continued NOAA space weather operations. Um, for the most part, the space the Gozar sensors are evolutionary. They're improvements on what's been done before. The exception being the solar ultraviolet imager, which I consider to be a revolutionary improvement in our space weather capability. Thank you. Okay, do we have any uh, questions for Bill? I have one to start off, actually. Um, Bill, I was just wondering, there was a recent uh, presidential executive order that was issued, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that does with NOAA's responsibilities for space weather, because I know that both NASA and NOAA do space weather. Um, Na NOAA has always had the Space Weather Prediction Center. But could you talk about that and what it means um, for, for NOAA? Well, at, at the, uh, well let, me, let me say, I'll, I'll go in a couple of directions on this, but what it really does is it codifies uh, NOAA's uh, responsibility in terms of being able to provide the, to be the civilian organization that provides alerts and warnings. Um, the military has their side of things. Uh, they have a, um, a comparable space weather operations up in Omaha. 
Okay? So that's really basically what the presidential executive order did is it codified that. Now, from a, um, um, what it also has done for the community, for the space weather community, is it's actually opened up a whole new facet of data for us. And um, in one of, the, one of the aspects in there, I think it's like five, I, task 5E, is for the Department of Energy to release their, um, their space weather data. Now, this is a, this is a what, what they refer to as a nuclear detection sensor that is sitting on the Department of Energy satellite systems. They're, both, they're, most, they're, they're in the geosynchronous orbit, as well as on every GPS has a new det detector, okay? And so what the presidential order did for, to me, okay, and I, I talked to my senior leadership and they said, you will make it happen, is that we are now in the position of releasing that data through NOAA to, to the public. Now, right now we're, we're releasing the historical data, but the idea is if we can push it a little bit further, and this is not part of the order, but it's certainly in the back of everybody's mind, is that we would now, if we could release this data in real time, then we, um, and then this could be a real boom to the space weather operations, real-time space weather operations. Uh, this is wrapped up in a lot of security issues that need to be addressed. So we're doing that first step. We, we actually, the first baby step has already occurred. We released a snippet of this data about uh, about a year ago through our through my website in in Boulder. Uh, now we're being directed to release all of the data through our website um, in a historical sense. And then, but so the next step that I see in the future is can we can we turn this into a real time capability? Just a, a quick follow up on that. That answer. Um, do you see any products emanating from? Uh, space weather prediction, your office in Boulder, uh, that could be of, of uh, in increased benefit to the broadcasters that are in the room to use on television when things happen. I know there's been an increase in the, in the amount of products, but I'm just wondering, what's, do, you have, do you know of a plan or some sort of evolution process for products? That, that whole idea behind uh, um, putting out the, uh, the Ovation product, which is that auroral map, so was was driven by what we would consider the um, rural enthusiasts, people um, who really, you know, who who are interested in looking at the aurora. Now, there's a, there's a whole set of users that Space Weather Prediction Center has, uh, that you know, power industry, satellite operations, things like that, which is sort of kind of far removed from from um, the man on the street. But when you get to um, the man on the street, um, being able to identify, you know, when um, when do we have ex, you know, ex, um, extreme space weather or enhanced space weather? And what is the probability that if I were to go outside tonight, I, I could see the aurora? So I mean, I would, very, um, I would really um, stress that you can just grab that image from, from them and make it, make it available. I'm not sure you can do it in, um, dynamically, but uh, that, that to me would be something that I think would, uh, would really resonate well with a, with a lot of folks. Maybe not so much in Florida, but certainly up in the Minnesota, that, that area. <laughs> Great, thanks. Other questions? Uh, anybody have? Jen? My question is about um, the launch tomorrow, because we've heard a lot about the weather criteria for launch, but is there a space weather criteria as part of that? Yes, there, actually there is. Um, and uh, the criteria goes back to the, those particle detectors. Um, if, if the current GOES measures enhanced particles in space, um, what they will do is they'll, they'll put a launch hold on it because those particles, if you were to get a, um, a single event upset, if, you particle, if one of these particles were, were to enter the sense of electronics um, of, the, of the spacecraft during, during launch, um, it, they, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be good. And so what they do is there is a criteria that, that says it has to be, um, um, it has to be environment, space weather quiet. And in fact, it is. Over the last, uh, we've been monitoring space weather for the last uh, couple of days and, you know, we really, um, we expect it to be um, very low space weather and for now and into the, into the next few days. Questions? Anyone else? Okay, Bill, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.